after the service. I will be at the front of the church and I have some to give. Here is Pastor Werner with part three of the series, Collection of Songs. Begin your praise. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you, whether you're here in person or online, we welcome you today, and we're so glad that you are joining us. We're in this series over the last few weeks, a collection of songs, and we talked about songs being a very important part of um, our lives, especially in Psalms. And so we are in this series, and we want to conclude our series today, this morning. If you, if you were to show me your iPad, or your smartphone, or some other device where you collect songs on, there is a playlist that you are probably collecting. I would probably find a variety of songs on that playlist that you have on your device. Now the appeal of those songs that you've collected, or perhaps even the lyrics, or the beat that you like, or the sound, or the group that you like, show, will show me what style of music you really like. And as you listen to your particular playlist, depending what situation you are in or find yourself in, those are the pieces of music that you will listen to or, or sing along with. When I wash my car, I listen to music on my garage stereo, and it is usually some kind of soft rock from the 70s or 80s, the time when I was growing up as a teenager, a young person. However, when I'm flying on an airplane and I plug into the device of the plane, I, my playlist is all symphony music. And when I'm in a com contemplative, reflective mood, maybe in my devotions in the evening, I listen to worship music in my quiet time with the Lord. Now there is, however, you need to know this, there is, however, a type, one type of music I don't listen to, maybe several types of music I don't listen to. Country music. Don't listen to country music, nor do I listen to rap music, and nor do I listen to acid rock. Those are songs that I just avoid from my playlist altogether. Well, some of you who are in your 60s and 70s may be really into that type of music, but I'm just not there yet. So today, as we wrap up this series in Psalms, I want to focus on this, this contemplative issue of worshiping God. Two weeks ago, we started with the Psalm of Confession, Psalm 38, and it's Songs that reflect, Psalm 38 is a song that reflects uh, a repentant heart coming back to a place of forgiveness where we receive forgiveness from God when we've seen our hearts wander, our lives wander from God. We started off with this psalm of confession. Then last week we talked about the psalm of suffering, Psalm 13, where yet in the midst of our difficulties, in the midst of our sufferings, there is a song that God wants to put on your hearts, and it's a song of faith in the sustaining power of God. So today, we want to look at another psalm, and it's the psalm of praise. These are five psalms found from Psalm 146 to 150. 146, 147, Psalm 148, Psalm 149, and Psalm 150. These particular psalms, these five psalms, help us keep a vertical relationship with God intact. Now, if you would just for a moment be honest, I think all of us would assess something very particular in our lives. That a lot of times we find it particularly difficult at times to be people who praise God. Some of us may even say, I struggle in this area of being in an attitude of praise to God. It doesn't come naturally. Because, you see, there's a tendency in our prayers that even though we call certain moments in times 
of worship or contemplative time, devotion time, however you want to, we find, we find that our definition of those moments is that we find ourselves asking God for things. It's not that we're worshiping God. It's not that we're praising God. But we are simply, now if you take a moment and you assess your time where you spend time in devotion and contemplation with God, if you take a moment and really assess what is happening in those moments, a lot of us probably could say, you know what? In these moments, I really do spend a lot of time asking God for things. And it's only a small fraction of time that we actually give praise to God for what He has done in our lives. In Psalms 146 through 150, there's something very unique. If you look at these psalms, is that every psalm in this section begins with the opening line and the closing line that are identical. And the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, it is the word, praise the Lord. Every one of those songs begins with, praise the Lord, and it ends with, praise the Lord. And literally, praise the Lord, in some translations of your Bible, literally, praise, praise the Lord is hallelujah. So every song in that section begins with hallelujah, and it ends with hallelujah. It begins with praise the Lord, and it ends with praise the Lord. Every one of those songs. These five comprehensive psalms at the end of the book of songs gives us some idea of what our lives ought to be like. That we are to be people who praise the Lord. And on our lips should be the word hallelujah. That's what these songs are describing for us. There is a capacity and should be a capacity in all of our lives to have upon our lips the praise the Lord anthem that we continually bring before God. Several years ago, there was a song written and sung by Larry Bryant. And in the lyrics, he takes a somewhat a jab against Christians who constantly overdose on asking God for help. And the song is entitled, Shopping List. Maybe you've heard it, or maybe you've even memorized some of the words as you've sung it. The words say, Lord, you've been so good to me, how could I ask for more? But since you said to ask, I will. Because what else is prayer for? The cattle on a thousand hills, they all belong to you. I don't need any cows right now, but something else might do. Give me this. I want that. Bless me, Lord, I pray. Grant me what I think I need to make it through the day. Make me wealthy. Keep me healthy. Fill in what I may miss on my never-ending shopping list. Sometimes, and I don't know how we've gotten there. Listen, sometimes, folks, in our worship to God, in our singing, in our praise to God, <laughs> God becomes somehow secondary to our perception with what we need physically, financially, and relation. Sometimes I find myself during my personal time of worship and adoration with God, if I'm not careful, if I'm not taking a deliberate, volitional, determined choice, if I'm not careful, it's easy to become very selfish and move to an egotistical level because I simply turn my time, my devotions, into a time where I am only looking out for myself. And the challenge is that we need to be people who don't focus everything inward to what I need. The challenge is when I am worshiping and when I am focused on giving praise to God and singing hallelujah before God, my focus should be all about fixing away from my needs to others and fixing my praise to who God is and who He is. 
and what he is capable of doing in your life, my life, and in the ministry of his church's life. It goes beyond my wants. It goes beyond my need. It's all about what God is and who God is and my relationship with God. I have a very good friend who has a beautiful, beautiful yacht. It's a 60-foot yacht in a marina north of Seattle. Good friend of mine. And for a number of years, he has used that boat to cruise among the islands in the Puget Sound. And he would take couples that he knew were probably struggling in their marriages or people who were, who were burnt out. He even took pastors who were on the, on the end who were afraid in, in their lives and contemplating getting out of the ministry, people who were just completely burned out. And he would take them on a week-long trip throughout the Puget Sound Islands on the water to bring recreation and refreshment to these people. And he, would, he told me, he said, it's an amazing, it's an uncanny fact that when these people got on my yacht, within 48 hours, within just a short amount of time, these people would let their hair down and they would begin to simply share openly and honestly. He says, I don't know how it transpired. I don't know if it was the scenery or just being away from things or being on the water. I don't know what transpired, but it was an uncanny fact that people just began to unburden themselves. And he would do this at no cost to people. And, and, and people would simply respond to his invitation as he would bless them. People were grateful. They were thrilled. They were uh, appreciative. They were emotionally charged, recharged. And a lot of times people were awestruck by the incredible scenery in the Puget Sound. And, and, and they were absolutely careful not to damage anything on the boat. And they would just have an incredibly great time. And when they got home, my friend said, a lot of times people, people would send him gift cards. Gift cards to restaurants, gift cards for travel, gift cards for the fuel that he spent on the, the travels. And a lot of times he would receive multiple emails from people and text messages and cards and letters people being absolutely appreciative of his generosity and hospitality. Now, let's take that illustration that I just gave you a step further. If you would suppose with me that this summer my friend receives correspondence from a family that, that he took out on the boat last year. He receives correspondence from a family that he had blessed previously, and they write him a letter or they send him an email and say, we don't, we, don't, we don't know what to do with our vacation this year. But we remember back a few months ago, you took us on this journey on your boat, and we had such a fantastic time in the islands of the Puget Sound, and, and it was such an inspiring, motivating time. And we have, during the second week of July of 2022, we have, some, we have an opening, and we would like to go on this cruise again. And because my friend is gracious and kind, he accommodates them. And they have a fantastic time. And a few weeks later, he again receives a gift card from them. He receives an email, and he receives a text message describing the wonderful time that they had on the boat. And then he receives an email, and he says, the next year, the same people call my friend, and they invite themselves on the boat. And they said, we would like, in fact, we've been on your boat twice now, and we have such a good time, we want to we go on that boat again, but this time, we can handle it. You don't even have to come along. In fact, we're going to bring some of our friends with us, and you don't need to chaperone us anymore. We know how to operate the boat. And after all, it's been exactly two weeks that we've spent on the boat, and we know how to handle this. After this third trip, again, the people send a beautiful text message, an email, uh, message, email message to him. But instead of saying thanks, there was a lot of criticism. A lot of criticism in this 
email. They were criticizing the boat, and they were saying things like, you know, this boat is getting a little older, and it's beginning to show some wear and tear, and, and uh, how come you're not maintaining the boat to the standard that we would like it to be when we take it on vacation with our friends? So as you're listening to this little story, do you notice the regression that is happening in this story? And wouldn't you, if you were my friend, the owner of a beautiful boat, wouldn't you want to say, you ungrateful people, I'm giving you a vacation free of charge. You can use my boat, and all you do is criticize and tell me what is wrong with my boat. You are so self-absorbed in yourself. Wouldn't you say that? Wouldn't you have those thoughts? Wouldn't you have those feelings? I wonder sometimes, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? I wonder sometimes if the God of creation feels the same way. You come face to face with your life and you recognize your sinfulness and you recognize that you need a Savior and you openly unashamedly understand and receive the provision of the difference that Jesus can make in your life. And you, begin, you go out and you tell your friends about the peace that he has brought into your life. And you, you begin to discover that your coworkers who don't know Christ see something different in you. And your coworkers see there's an incredible change that has happened in your life. And one year later, one year later, in your prayers, in your personal time, in your devotion time, in your conversation, there's a change that begins to transpire. And you focus, you focus on what you want from God rather than what He has done for you. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, rather than fixating on the greatness of God and the provision of God and what He has done in, in your life, we begin to focus on what, need, what He needs to fix in our lives and what He needs to provide in our lives right now. In other words, one year later, rather than celebrating the goodness and the wonder of God's salvation in our life, all of a sudden, we now, one year later, begin to tell God what we want from Him. We used to worship His deity. We used to worship and, and be, be in awe of His grandeur. But now, all we want is how, how can God provide for me and my desire? We want all the comfort that this world provides for us in our culture. We, we, forget, we forget of the one who brought this universe into existence and who redeemed us and, and saved us. We forget about that. Now it's all about what can he do for me? At first, we're enamored with God's grace. In the first moment, we are awestruck by His forgiveness towards us. In the first moments, salvation to us is an incredible experience. I remember, I remember the first day after after I got saved the night before, the first day, the trees looked different. The leaves on the trees looked different. I still remember that vivid moment when I, when I came to Christ. There was a whole new perspective on life. There was a whole new beauty that I discovered. It was this, this moment of intense cleansing, and I saw the world differently. I saw the intricacies and the beauty in one leaf. That's how transformative salvation can be. And at the beginning, at the beginning, we, we experience this in an incredible, dynamic way. But then as time goes on, this vibrancy, this newness, begins to wear off and 
We just want God's goodness for ourselves and our praise that should be directed towards God begins to be turned and our praise begins to turn towards ourselves and it's replaced, our praise is replaced by requests for me. Here's the question. Here's the question. Is true praise towards your Heavenly Father, your Savior, the Holy Spirit, is true praise a daily part of our lives? Do you actually praise God and thank Him for what He is doing and has done in your life? Do you take time to simply adore Him for who He is? Or is our prayer simply a means to an end? A repetitive event just to get what we want? Is, is our prayer, is our worship, is even our church attendance is it simply a means to an end to somehow get what we want? So in this moment of self-reflection as we've been studying these psalms, in this moment of self-reflection, when was the last time you stopped and paused your life to praise God for His power, for His wisdom, for His character, for His love, for His goodness? When was the last time you sang with vibrancy and prayed with vibrancy and even said, praise the Lord, hallelujah. This is the day God has made. And I'm going to be glad and I'm going to rejoice in it. Or do you have a list of all the things that you're criticizing God for. You wake up in the morning and, yeah, I, thank God it's raining. The wind is too strong. Man, gas prices are high. God, I wish you would do something about that. So each one of these psalms, when you read Psalm 146 through 150, gives us reasons why we should praise God for Him. When you wake up in the morning, and when you get up, and when you live your life, and you go through the mundane, routine life with all of its ups and downs, these five psalms give us reasons why praise, why praise the Lord and hallelujah should be on all of our lips. And the first reason is God alone can save. That's the first reason we praise God. God alone can save. Look what it says in Psalm 146, verse 1 through verse 3. Look what it says. Praise the Lord, or some, some of your translations in the Bible say hallelujah. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. This, this identifies, this, these verses identify our tendencies, doesn't it? We think, that, we think that there is an earthly answer for all of life's problems. Did you notice people put their hope, did you notice in life that people put their hope in sports heroes and they put their hope in political leaders and they, they are enamored by the wealthy and the influential and the tr attractive. How is it that Hollywood somehow provides for us a goal and an aspiration of this is what life is all about? But whatever those people, politicians, sports heroes, the influential actors, whatever they can provide for us, or whatever you think they can provide for us, listen, it's only temporary. Whatever hope or salvation or advice these individuals offer is only temporary. Now, please don't understand. People in those categories can do a lot of good, and some of them spend a lot of money to end their influence, to do things with their resources that you and I can't do. 
but it is usually done in a humanistic, earthly endeavor and perspective. There is one difference, a key difference, a key difference between lower taxes and having my debt totally forgiven, completely wiped out. There is no comparison to that. We can put our emphasis on figures and people and personalities, and we can be enamored with all those resources that people have and the way they distribute their money, but there is one big difference, and there is no comparison to that. They can't wipe out my personal sin. There is a big difference between a loving doctor who can, listen, a loving doctor who can play a significant role in lengthening my life from 67 years to 72 years. God bless doctors who can do that. Medicine is fantastic and can do fantastic things in prolonging our life. But there is still no comparison. As much as doctors and medicine can do for us, there is no comparison to the great physician who can enable you to live for all eternity. There's no comparison. The only one who can truly save us from our own destruction is worthy to be praised. It is no wonder how this psalm Psalm 146 concludes in verse 10. It says, The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God, O Jerusalem, throughout the generation. There it is again. It ends with, what do you ought to do? Praise the Lord. Because God has the capacity to save when no one else can bring those things into being in your life. God can do that for you. Praise the Lord. for you. The second thing is, is that God created us to praise him. Psalm 147, verse 1 says, Praise the Lord. How good to sing praises to our God. How delightful and how fitting. It is, it is a quite a natural and fitting response to give praise to the one who intervenes in your life. When you've gone through challenges and when you've gone through trials and when you've gone through difficulties and you thought you weren't able to navigate through difficult situations, all of us have experienced, I'm sure, some aspect of heartache and hardship and difficulty in your life. And you feel like joy can never be a part of your life again. But can I tell you, that God intervened and God has done something powerful and significant in your life, and that gives you the onus to praise Him. That gives you the opportunity to praise Him. When you've experienced the incredible shifting and delivering power, the, the intervention of God, it gives you the onus to praise Him. Psalm 147, verse 3 and 5. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds he counts the stars and calls them all by name. How great is our God? How great is our Lord? He is, his, his power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. And for no other reason, that is why you praise God. For it. And lastly, God deserves our praise. Not only does he save, not only has he created us to praise him, but he deserves our praise. Psalm 148, verse 5 through verse 13. Now, this is an extended verse here. Let me read it to you. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord. He, for he issued his, his command, and they came into being. He set them in place forever and ever. His decree will never be revoked. Praise the Lord from the earth, you creatures of the ocean depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, wind and weather that obey him, mountain and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all livestock, small scurrying animals, that includes squirrels and birds, kings of the earth and all the people, rulers and judges of the earth, young men and young women, old men and children. Let them all praise 
the name of the Lord, for his name is very great. His glory towers over the earth and heaven. I don't know if you got the picture of these verses. The picture is here of an incredible declaration that everything should praise the Lord and that God is king and ruler over everything. He has dominion over everything. In my first pastorate in Texas, near Houston, Texas, our church parking lot joined the high school football stadium parking lot. And in the fall, every year, every Friday night, there was a high school football game happening at that stadium. And it, listen, if you've ever been, if you've never been to a Texas high school game, it's, an, it's an, a sight to behold. Not only is there a parade every Friday down Main Street of all the teams and all the cheerleaders and the band and the parents float and the concession stand float. I mean, everybody's floating down Main Street and they're celebrating this upcoming football game. And when the game starts, 20,000 people cram into this stadium, and there is live television, live radio. Everybody is wearing the team colors. On one side is the home team. On the other side is the visiting team. And it is absolute and complete bedlam. Friday nights in the fall in Texas. Someone went to a Raptors game from our church while they were in the playoffs. I've never been to a Raptors game at Scotiabank Arena, so I can't say exactly what transpires in the stadium, but I have witnessed and I've seen glimpses on the news of the bedlam that happens while the Raptors are playing basketball in the stadium. Now, I've never been there, but I can tell you one thing. I can tell you with almost 100% certainty that this doesn't happen at a Raptors game, where right before the game is to start, a guy walks out on center court with a tuxedo on, and he takes the mic by hand, and he says into the mic, ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? I need to go over some items before this game starts. When we come back in a few moments from a TV commercial, millions of people will be tuning in from all across Canada and the United States, and I really need some of you to really get your excitement on. You need to show me that you really care for this Raptors team. Cheer for your team, and get ready to put your scream on. Also, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to stand sometimes and on occasion show your excitement while you are standing. Now, here's where I really need your help, ladies and gentlemen. If our team starts losing, I need you to start crying because Cameras will be panning across the audience, and they need to see close-ups of some of you crying. Also, in the second half, we are going to sing our fight song. We are going to pass out music sheets and memorize the words, because in the second half, we are going to sing our Raptors fight song. And if our team hits a three-point shot, or there is a slam dunk that happens, that is a good thing. And all of you in the stands need to scream, stand up, and become delirious. Here's a new thing we are adding this year. And this is really important for all of you Raptors fans. It's added this year. If an opposing player, that's the people who are not cheering for, if an opposing player misses his shot and misses the rim, all of you need to start shouting. Air ball, 
air ball, air ball. And here's another added thing that we're adding this year to all you Raptors fans. Every time that, that player who just missed his shot handles the ball, not only do we start chanting air ball, but we need to remind him that he is a complete failure. And one last thing, one last thing, fans. The three men who are wearing black and white on the court, those stripes represent the referee. And every time, because you know they're blind, every time they make a bad call, you let out boos. Now, that probably doesn't happen at Scotiabank Arena. See, nobody needs to stand up in the middle of the arena and give a tutorial or give instructions and teach the fans who are at the game, at the sporting event, how to become fanatics. Because those people in the stands, they are devoted to the team. And the moment the ball is tipped, bedlam breaks out. And you know the interesting thing? The people who are most reserved in church, who are at that game, and no one's told them a thing. No one's told them a thing. You see, you do not need to teach enthusiasm. You don't need to teach loyalty and you don't need to teach passion at a sporting rim when the crowd are the fans of the team. And by the same token, listen, you should not need to teach enthusiasm and passion to people who love Jesus. It should be who we are. It should be who we are. It should come naturally to us because we understand who the creator of the universe is we understand who has saved us. And we need to simply step forward as followers of Jesus. And our praise should be heartfelt. It should be intense. It should be electric. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for He is worthy. And these psalms describe the hallelujah that should be on our lips. For He was crucified. He lived a perfect life. He came from heaven into, into this earth, onto this earth. And He died for our sin. You really think a worship leader needs to spend time saying a good word on Christ's behalf? No, it should be in us. It should be in us. You should walk into the sanctuary of the Lord. You should walk into this holy place and you should be in a place of adoration and worship. When we stand and when we sing, we lift our hands and we lift our voices because our praise, our praise is to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And if you can do it at a basketball game or you can do it at a hockey game or you can do it at a football game, you certainly can do it in the sanctuary of the Lord. See, in Luke 19, at the triumphal entry of Jesus, Jesus was at the height of his popularity, and he's riding into Jerusalem on the donkey, and the people in the crowd is sh are shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there is the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the group of religious leaders. They're, they're standing there saying, Hold it, hold the parade. Stop the procession. You can't do that. And they asked Jesus to silence the people who are shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Silence those people. Silence them. And Jesus says these words in Luke 19, verse 39 and verse 40. If they keep quiet, the stones along the road 
would burst out into cheers. See, if the living and breathing followers of Jesus are silent, God has the capacity, listen, God has the capacity to take inanimate objects who would rise up and proclaim the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has that capacity. Psalm 149, verse 3 to verse 5. Praise the name with dancing accompanied by the tambourine and harp for the Lord delights in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let the faithful rejoice that he honors them. Let them sing for joy as they lie on their bed. God takes delight in his people. That's why we come come together corporately. That's why we come together on weekends like this to praise. And when we leave, our lives should be filled with worship throughout the week where we bring glory and honor and praise to our God. For blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One last verse. Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, people have come to me over the last couple of years as we've been through this pandemic. Even now, people are coming to me and they're ask, they're asking, they ask this question. What do, you th- what do you think is truly happening in the world? Are we in the end times? What's going on? Pandemic, food supplies cut short, wars going on catastrophes in the world. What's going on? What is happening in the world? People have asked, numerous people have come to me over these last two years, what is going on in the world? You know, to be really honest with you, I have to say to you, I don't know. I don't know. Are we in the end times? Maybe, perhaps, I don't know. Do I like what's going on in the world? No, I don't. Where are we headed? I don't know. And if you listen to anybody who has a clear directive, they're probably a false prophet because none of us know. Listen, none of us. But we want answers. We need answers. We, we're, we're living in this chaos in this world. What is going on? And, and to a certain degree, it's, it's creating fear in us. So people come and say, what do you think is going to happen in this world? There's crazy stuff going on, catastrophes and wars, and there are more displaced people in the world than ever before in the history of the world, roaming this earth, trying to find safety and peace. What's going on? Honestly, I can tell you, I don't know. But I do know this. I do know this. We are rapidly moving toward a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the meantime, we better get our praise on. Because the Bible says, as we read a few moments ago, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. How? Let's pray together. Oh God, may you stir up in all of us again. Revive in us, oh God, a spirit of rejoicing, a spirit that is full of joy. Revive in us again, oh God, personally in each one of our lives, an attitude of praise towards you that we would continually and daily have hallelujah upon our lips, 
where we acknowledge that you are the one who saves, that you are the absolute creator of the universe who deserves our praise. And more than anything else, oh God, may we become creatures who learn as we have breath in our lungs to praise you with everything that we've got. Jesus, I pray, may this become a new day for all of us. Instead of praying for our own needs, may we, oh God, extol you for your goodness and your mercy and your forgiveness and your kindness and your grace that you bestow. Your forgiveness, oh God, that is upon me right now. Oh God, all these people, let them experience their goodness in a new, fresh way so that it brings fresh praise to our Lord. Jesus, I pray for this in your holy name and all of God's people say, Amen and Amen. Those of you who joined us online today, we're going to sh shut off now and we're going to move into a baptism time here in our sanctuary. We ask God's blessing upon you. Have a great week. And we'll see you again next week. And if you have it in your heart to attend a live service, we ask you to start making plans to do that today.